Okay, thanks for your patience. Um, welcome everyone. Um, we're happy to have you here today. My name is Elizabeth Brooke and I'm a member of the Systemic Investigations team at the Office of the Ombudsperson. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today's webinar will be presented by Jay Chalk, Ombudsperson of British Columbia, and Sarah Milan, an Ombudsperson Officer with our Office of Systemic Investigation team. I also want to thank Julie Pollack, Midori Kaga, and Kira Morgan, the other members of our team who are providing support on the back end. Our topic today is our recent investigation into two provincial emergency management programs and our public report, which was released earlier this month. Um, I'd like to take a moment um, to begin at the beginning to acknowledge that we're presenting this webinar to you from our offices on Fort Street in Victoria. We acknowledge with respect that the Office of the Ombudsperson is located on the unceded traditional territory of the Lekwungen people and ancestors, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. It's with respect and gratitude that we're doing our work on these lands. I will also note that the work of our office extends across the homelands of many different indigenous peoples within what we now call British Columbia. As part of our work at our office, we're committed to reconciliation with indigenous peoples and we're continuing to expand how administrative fairness incorporates or should incorporate indigenous perspectives, laws, and values. Um, the webinar will last about an hour, um, including some time for a Q&A at the end. But first, we'll just go over some housekeeping details um, and then provide some quick background about the role of the ombudsperson for those who may be less familiar before we move on to our discussion of the investigation. So let's just go quickly over a few Zoom housekeeping items to start. Given the number of participants that we have today, um, the Zoom chat function is turned off for participants. You can ask questions at any time through the Q&A function, and I'm happy to see a couple have come in. Um, and you'll find that if you haven't already at the bottom of your screen in the toolbar. Please send your questions in throughout the webinar. Um, Jay will answer some questions live at the end of our session, and we'll try to respond to all those that we receive. We do have a large number of people attending today, so if we don't get to your question during the webinar, we'll do our best to respond directly to you afterwards. Please include your email address to facilitate that, or please email us directly afterwards and we'll respond. We'll provide the email address at the end of the session for you to jot down. Questions can also be sent to us anonymously if you prefer. Okay, next, um, you will see that there's some, there are automatic closed captions on. Um, if you do not want them on, you can go to the bottom of your screen to the closed caption icon and turn them off. You can also change your view of the presentation using the view button at the top right of your screen. You can click that and choose how you'd like to view things. Finally, we'll be recording the webinar um, and posting it on our website. If you wish to reference the online version of our report as we go, we'll post it in, your, in the chat uh, now or soon um, for your convenience. There it is, perfect. Okay, thank you for your attention to those details. And let's begin by introducing Jay Chalk, Ombudsperson, for an overview of the work of our office and an introduction to our investigation. Jay, over to you. Great, thank you, Elizabeth, and good morning, everybody. And thank you for uh, uh, taking the, uh, the time this morning to uh, learn a little bit about uh, this recent report of ours. Um, so the Office of the Ombudsperson uh, is established under provincial law. Uh, to independently oversee the delivery of public services uh, in British Columbia. We receive, uh, investigate, and resolve complaints from individuals um, about unfair treatment in public service delivery. Uh, there's a, a Supreme Court of Canada case from the 1980s that had a lot to say about uh, the role of our office in providing oversight of government. And one of the things uh, that, that the Supreme Court of Canada said is that we shine a light on places and practices uh, that might otherwise be hidden from view. And we do this by conducting investigations. We receive complaints from individuals, but we also conduct broader systemic investigation using the ombudsperson's own motion authority. Uh, these are large scale investigations where we look at Im uh, issues that impact a, a broad number of people um, that are systemic or structural in nature. And uh, in those, uh, uh, following those investigations, we report publicly uh, and make recommendations to public bodies for structural and long lasting change. We monitor uh, and report on the implementation of accepted recommendations 
and our po office's power uh, is really in uh, in persuasion uh, and using that persuasive voice. Um, we don't order public bodies uh, to act, so we're not like a court in that way, but we can shine a light on unfairness uh, and we can marshal public opinion uh, behind uh, appropriate issues. So uh, we conducted this systemic investigation really asking a big question. You know, how is the provincial government doing uh, in supporting people um, who have been displaced uh, from their homes as a result uh, of extreme weather? Uh, climate change is a global reality. And in our province of British Columbia, we're seeing the impacts of that vividly uh, and deeply. Uh, we've seen heat domes, uh, atmospheric rivers, extreme drought and wildfires. These extreme weather events are displacing tens of thousands of people from their homes and their communities, and government is grappling uh, with how best to respond. We did this investigation because we know that with the increasing impacts of climate change, provincial support programs will only become more important. There have been numerous reports on how to better prepare and respond to climate change related disasters like this. Uh, our report builds on those earlier reports uh, and that, and Many of our, our recommendations for change echo things that have been said earlier. Uh, for example, the independent review of the 2017 uh, flood and wildfire seasons. It's also informed by, uh, by connecting to global standards uh, like the Sendai framework and the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous people. Our focus uh, as an ombuds office is on fairness and on the experiences of ordinary people who've been impacted by extreme weather events. Fairness includes consideration of reconciliation, equity, uh, and climate change. So we examined two disaster financial support programs in BC, emergency support services, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with as ESS, uh, and disaster financial assistance or DFA. And so we asked how ESS and DFA support or not support uh, people who have had to leave their homes, particularly uh, for extended periods of time. It's really important that there is support for people in the aftermath of a disaster. And it's equally uh, important that these programs deliver support fairly uh, and to the people who need it the most. We asked, are supports accessible and are they delivered in a way that mitigates the likelihood of disproportionate impacts for those who are the most vulnerable? In other words, can the people who will benefit from these supports ask, access them fairly? And if not, why? So we released our report um, at the beginning of October. Uh, we made 20 recommendations to government. Uh, and note that the focus of our investigation is on the role uh, of, uh, of the provincial government, now part uh, at the time, uh, EMBC, now part of the Provincial uh, Ministry of Emergency Management uh, and Climate Readiness, because it's the central coordinating body uh, for emergency management in British Columbia. The Minister of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness has formally accepted all of these recommendations and we'll, we will monitor how government implements uh, these recommendations going forward. So we use the extreme weather events of 2021 as a case study uh, in our investigation. And that was the summer of the heat dome, intensive wildfires in the Southern interior and an atmospheric river in mid November that caused catastrophic flooding uh, and, and landslides tens of thousands of people were evacuated as a result of those events. And we focused on the extreme uh, events of 2021 because they reflect the realities of climate change. More frequent, more severe weather that may result in more people being forced to leave their homes uh, and communities. And we know that extreme weather displaces people from their homes and sometimes from their communities entirely. Uh, this kind of displacement is very disruptive. It impacts people's mental health and physical health as well as access to healthcare, housing and education. Uh, displacement also impacts people's livelihoods, uh, their ability to attend their jobs uh, and their financial security. We use this case study to understand that, uh, how the disaster support programs are being delivered. Using the, a case study approach allowed us to identify barriers that people face in accessing the support programs and the gaps uh, that people experienced in using the supports. Uh, but we really looked at how do they work in practice? Our objective and carefully looking at what happened is so that we can identify opportunities for improvement and recommend those to government. So our role uh, uh, as the ombudsperson is to look at how public programs like disaster uh, support programs are being delivered. 
And specifically, we're investigating whether they're being delivered fairly. And that means, are they accessible? Were they delivered in a timely way? Were they communicated properly? Were people's individual circumstances taken into account? Were policies and procedures being followed adequately, et cetera? So we often think uh, about fairness uh, as a fairness triangle, um, which considers fairness uh, in three different aspects. Um, service delivery, in or in other words, how are people treated? Uh, fairness in procedure, or is the process designed and, and, and implemented in a manner uh, that is follows the rules of administrative fairness? And fairness in outcomes, uh, or whether outcomes are equitable and meeting the intended purpose of the program. So, but fairness also considers, um, uh, includes considerations of uh, reconciliation and equity, and, as well as climate change. So, extreme weathered events are not uh, felt equally by everybody. Uh, instead, they disproportionately impact people who are already uh, socially disadvantaged, whether that be by colonialism, by systemic inequity, uh, or by systemic discrimination. Indigenous people are more likely to be disproportionately impacted by displacement as a result of extreme weather. An equity approach acknowledges that different people require different services to participate uh, fully in society. And a fair support program must understand the lived experience of those in it is intending to serve. In our investigation, we heard from hundreds of evacuees through our, we posted a questionnaire early in our investigation. Um, we also uh, spoke to people uh, uh, who contacted our office and when our team and I traveled uh, to the southern interior and people were generous in sharing their time and frankly their stories of pain and loss and throughout the investigation I was very impressed by the generosity uh, and the resilience of British Columbians even in the face of disasters and the dedicated work of the many volunteers and communities who come to come together to support uh, uh, their neighbors uh, when these events occur. So I'm now going to hand it over to uh, Sarah Milan to describe more uh, about our investigation. Sarah. Great. Thanks, Jay. I'm going to share a little bit about how we did our investigation and then move on to share our key findings and recommendations. So we did our investigation over approximately 18 months. Over that time, we sought information and evidence from a variety of different sources. As Jay has mentioned, we heard from many people with lived experience of being evacuated and displaced from their homes. We heard from about 500 people that responded to a public facing questionnaire. We also spoke with volunteers and local emergency management practitioners. We talked with leadership from First Nations. We also talked with leadership from municipalities and regional districts. We spoke with ministry staff and reviewed and analyzed data that was held by EMBC with respect to the two programs. So all of this information taken together informed our findings and recommendations that are set out in detail in our report and that I'll talk a little bit about here. Our findings. So we made nine findings of unfairness in the administration of ESS and DFA. And based on these findings, we made 20 recommendations to government with the aim of improving those programs moving forward. Now, some of our findings and recommendations are very specific to ESS and DFA, and some of our findings and recommendations engage with a bigger picture assessment of the gaps and the emissions and the provincial approach to supporting people displaced by extreme weather. We'll walk through our key findings and recommendations now, but we'll also post a link to a comprehensive list of those findings and recommendations in the chat. Starting with the big picture, <clears throat> we know that tens of thousands of people were evacuated and had to leave their homes all over the province because of the wildfires and flooding in 2021. Some people were displaced for a couple of days, but many people were displaced for months and some, some are still displaced today. We also, as Jay has talked about, know that the impact of the 2021 events were uneven and that First Nations and Métis communities were disproportionately impacted systemic racism, ongoing colonialism, and discriminatory practices exacerbate the risks for Indigenous people in disaster events. And this vulnerability and the heightened exposure to risk can make it very difficult to access resources and supports in the response and the recovery phases. In our investigation, we found that the complexity of large-scale and compounding disasters is exceeding the current design 
and capacity of the provincial programs. As climate change increases, the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events means people are being displaced more often and for longer periods of time. The impacts of displacement are being made worse by the housing affordability crisis, and there's not currently a plan in place for supporting people who are displaced for long periods of time. I'm going to narrow a little bit from the big picture and share more about the specific programs. Now, the first program people typically encounter when they are evacuated is emergency support services. And if, if it's possible just to move this slide to the next piece, there we go, that's great. That'll help follow along. Right, so the first program people typically encounter when they're evacuated is emergency support services or ESS. Now, ESS is a core provincial program that is designed to support people after a disaster. ESS provides short-term financial support for basic needs like food and lodging until evacuees can return home or are no longer in need. Now the delivery of ESS on the ground is complex. It's funded primarily by the province, but it's organized by local emergency management programs and is designed to be delivered primarily by local volunteers. In our investigation, we heard about things that were working and also things that were not working, things that were creating unfair outcomes. Firstly, we heard across the board that a program like ESS is critically important. We heard that supporting basic needs in the immediate period after a disaster is central for individual and community well being. That providing timely supports can ease and lessen the negative impacts and the stressors that people experience when they're evacuated. We also heard the importance of how that support is delivered how people were treated when they sought out support. We heard about what a difference it made when people were treated with empathy and with respect, and also when supports were provided in a timely way and a responsive way, meeting people where they were at. But we also found that the current one size fits all model of ESS creates unfair barriers for some people to access the supports that they need. And we found that these barriers are being experienced, again, unevenly. These barriers are faced more by Indigenous people, people with disabilities, people with lower incomes and less financial resources, older people, and people with physical and mental health needs. So as an example, the concern we heard most from people after the large-scale events in 2021 was about long confusing and stressful waits at reception centers. Now, for some context and to be clear, we understand that the concerns about long waits at reception centers are really specific to those large scale evacuation events. This does not apply to smaller or more routine ESS responses. In our investigation, we heard how people adapted to those long waits to access ESS, sometimes waiting for six to eight hours in line, sometimes sleeping in cars to rejoin the line in the morning, sometimes leaving to go somewhere else to try to get support, and sometimes abandoning getting ESS supports altogether. And what we heard clearly that was so compelling in our investigation was how unique people's experiences were depending on their personal circumstances. For example, a person who was a caregiver of a family member with dementia had a very different experience waiting in line than another person without caregiving responsibilities. We also heard stories from people with mobility and health challenges that simply could not wait in line or experience significant hardship in doing so. The, their experiences were much different than an able-bodied person trying to access ESS supports. And so what we found was that the requirement that all evacuees wait in line to receive supports on a first come first serve basis, well, that appears neutral and fair because it treats everyone the same, had the effect of placing caregivers and people with disabilities, limited mobility and other health challenges at a significant disadvantage because of their personal circumstances. We also heard from Indigenous people who shared the challenges that they had in accessing ESS. 
We heard that some Indigenous people experience racism and discrimination in trying to access ESS, and that this created a barrier for some Indigenous people to receive ESS supports at all. We also heard positive stories about what is working to better support Indigenous families. For example, we heard about the importance of relationship building and liaison work in the delivery of ESS at a local level. And we heard about the really valuable work that Finesse is doing in connecting people with resources who otherwise might not have received them or might have encountered difficulty in receiving them. It was clear from our investigation that community-based approaches to emergency response that was grounded in cultural safety helped Indigenous evacuees access ESS services and created more positive outcomes. People shared with us their experience in trying to access ESS. Many of these first-hand accounts are highlighted in our report, but here are just two, and I'll, and I'll read them. Quote, as a person with a registered disability that affects mobility, it was very painful and draining to stand in long lineups and wait for hours to register at an ENS, ESS that has limited seating and no seating for the outside lineups and no parking, which requires walking a distance, end quote. Another person shared with us, quote, the lines were so long that three times I gave up because it meant leaving my palliative care mom unsupervised, end quote. These experiences, among many others, tell us how important it is to have a more inclusive and responsive program of support. In our investigation, we, we also analyzed the available ESS data from 2021. This was the data that was captured in ERA at the time. And our analysis of the ESS data available showed us that between this June and December of 2021, the vast majority of people needed supports for longer than 72 hours. So this chart on the screen shows that of all the households that received ESS that were recorded in ERA, 90% of those households received ESS for longer than 72 hours. Now, in some circumstances, this was even greater. For example, for the households that were evacuated from Merritt in November after the atmospheric river, 97% of those households received ESS for more than 72 hours. Now, <clears throat> the length of time that households received ESS is varied. From the data that we saw, the average number of days these households received ESS was 20 days and the median was 15 days. One household received ESS for 174 days. These timelines are far outside what ESS is designed for. And despite significant efforts in the moment to stretch the program to extend those ESS benefits in order to help people, it's clear that there are limitations to the continually extending ESS approach. And so are recommendations. We made recommendations to the province with the aim of embedding equitable service delivery on the ground. This includes providing safe and accessible spaces by making local reception centers accessible, by integrating cultural safety throughout the program and providing more flexible assistance that allows people more autonomy and choice in how and where they receive and then use financial support. We also made recommendations to the province to strengthen how it supports local community-led ESS. Because we heard in our investigation that, for example, the long and the confusing waits occurred in part because the local capacity of ESS in some communities was simply overwhelmed by the scale of the compounding events and the large number of people who were evacuated and seeking support at the same time. We heard clearly in our investigation about the need for strengthening provincial support for community-led ESS, including providing effective search support for large-scale ESS responses, for integrating professional mental health care into the program delivery, and for creating a reliable centralized communication hub for evacuees. Thirdly, there's a need to respond to the increasing reality of long-term displacement. We made a recommendation for the province to develop 
in collaboration with local authorities and First Nations, a strategy to support an increasing number of people experiencing long-term displacement due to extreme weather. I'm gonna turn now to Disaster Financial Assistance, or DFA. Now, our investigation looked only at the private sector DFA, which is available to homeowners and residential tenants not the public sector DFA program, which is for communities. So people apply for DFA when they've lost their homes or essential belongings and they don't have insurance or enough insurance to cover their losses. They're looking to government for help to rebuild their homes and replace their belongings. DFA provided $32.6 million in assistance to BC homeowners and tenants impacted by the atmospheric river events in 2021. However, DFA support is limited by design. For example, it does not apply to losses resulting from wildfires, and it only helps to restore the very basics. In our investigation, we found that people seeking DFA experienced significant delays, unclear procedures, and poor communication, all of which were very stressful for people who've lost their home and are trying to rebuild. Many people who did apply for DFA experienced significant delays in receiving a response. This contributed to longer term displacement. We heard that the program didn't always meet people's needs and that communication with applicants was poor. Concerningly, at one point, the program simply stopped communicating with people about their applications. Most people who appealed are still waiting for a decision. In our questionnaire, we heard from Indigenous people about their experiences with DFA. They were less likely than non-Indigenous participants to have heard of DFA and were more likely to not have insurance that met their needs. We found that the ministry has very limited information about who accesses the program and who doesn't. And we found that the program does not support individual or community resilience through building back better, which is a key element of the Sendai framework. Here's a quote from one of the people who completed our questionnaire. Quote, DFA stands for disaster financial assistance. Disaster means act quickly. Financial means provide money. Assistance means help. None of these have been provided. All need to be, end quote. We also heard from another person, quote, making people wait in limbo for months on end is unacceptable. It took DFA nine months to tell us we didn't qualify for help. That was prime time for reconstruction. Now we're in the process of appealing the decision, which also takes time. We can't go to the bank and ask for a construction loan until these other avenues are decided on. So we continue to be in limbo and it looks like that will be the case for many months to come." End quote. We heard from many people about their gratitude and appreciation for the support provided by DFA. But you can also see here the frustration that people experienced, especially particularly with the disconnect between expectations for the program and the reality of how it was administered. We made several recommendations on improving fairness in how DFA is administered. First thing, there has to be communication the province needs to let people know what is happening with their application or their appeal. And there has to be capacity to respond in a timely manner moving going forward. We recommended improved capacity to prevent delays in processing applications, better communication with the public and applicants, and the collection of sociodemographic data to inform equitable improvements to program delivery. We know that DFA was not designed for the complexities of more frequent and compounding climate change related extreme events. Modernizing the DFA program has to account for these new realities, becoming more people-centered while also increasing resiliency going forward. Now DFA is not intended to replace private insurance or other resources people may have to rebuild. It's designed to ensure people can replace necessities. Those are important after a disaster, but that basic level of assistance does not necessarily get people back to where they were before. It's reasonable for government to expect people obtain insurance for their homes when they can. 
what is also clear is that insurance isn't always affordable. It isn't always available. And that climate change is rapidly redefining both of those questions. We do know that there's a lot of work underway to consider developing a national flood insurance program with the idea that a program like that may reduce the need for DFA after flooding events. That's part of a much bigger discussion that is beyond our investigation, beyond our report, and on the question of who should bear responsibility for these losses. That is for the province and the federal government to work out, and that will inform the future of DFA. In the meantime, the DFA regulations will be modernized as part of the new legislation government has introduced. And it's good to see that the province has just launched a public consultation on updating the DFA program that reflects a number of the issues we identified. We'll put a link to that consultation in the chat. And I'm gonna hand it back to Jay to talk more about looking forward. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, as I indicated earlier, um, in addition to the two key programs of ESS and, and DFA, we also looked at sort of the broader questions of how the province is planning for the future. And uh, our investigation showed that the existing programs uh, were not designed to uh, and do not address the complexity of climate related disasters and long term displacement. And as a result, we also made findings and recommendations that direct attention to key gaps uh, in the existing approach uh, and identify some fairer paths forward. So overall, um, we found that the ministry does not have a plan uh, for responding to long-term displacement and the existing programs, ESS and DFA, were not designed uh, to address the complexity of large scale and compounding and extended climate related disasters. We know that people need ESS supports beyond 72 hours as Sarah outlined, and DFA should provide greater flexibility and assistance to reduce the likelihood of repeat events. Private insurance um, has an important role uh, in supporting people uh, who've been displaced by disaster, but as the impacts of climate change increase, the affordability and availability of insurance uh, could well change. And affordability and accessibility of insurance should, uh, should be a key focus of ongoing work of modernization, and the government should better communicate publicly about the ways in which private insurance interacts with the accessibility of provincial programs. And finally, we know that Indigenous people and communities have expertise and knowledge uh, to contribute to emergency management across the four pillars of mitigation, preparation, uh, management, uh, and response and recovery. More than this, uh, providing emergency response and recovery leadership in their communities is inextricably linked to First Nations jurisdiction over their land and resources. And First Nations and Métis communities have the experience, skills, and knowledge about how to best care for community members. It's important that government uh, honor commitments that it's made uh, in the De Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act and that government supports core principles uh, in self-determination, self-government and participation uh, in decision making. And based on our findings, we made some broader recommendations uh, to the Ministry of Emergency Management uh, and Climate Readiness. Many of our recommendations built on those uh, in the Abbott and Chapman report from 2018 uh, which looked at the 2017 uh, weather events and other reports uh, on past extreme weather and displacements in the province. Government has accepted and committed to implement all our recommendations and has also introduced new legislation, um, which is uh, just uh, currently before the legislature. They've also started an online consultation on modernizing the DFA regulation that um, Sarah put the link into a moment ago. And we hope that together this work will enable significant change to the way that programs and supports are delivered on the ground. And that's really the focus of our report. So as the province moves forward to modernize emergency management, we recommend that it consult broadly on developing a plan for long-term displacement and that it continually assess the availability of insurance uh, as climate impacts increase. And we recommend that the province work with Indigenous governing bodies to advance self-determination and emergency management, including by prioritizing capacity building and ensuring consistent appropriate funding and that a report out uh, on that work as part of its annual reporting on the Declaration Act uh, Action Plan. So I know that's a lot to digest and rightly so as the intricacies and complexities of climate change are significant and so too um, uh, are the associated support programs that we're talking about today. And so as we wrap up, I just uh, really wanna thank the, or 
uh, I think that there are really three key takeaways uh, that I want to draw your attention to. Number one, um, you know, when delivering public programs, people need to come first. Um, when we started this investigation, we, st we started with a public uh, questionnaire aimed at hearing the experiences of people who were displaced uh, from their homes by the fires and floods in 2021. And what we heard was not necessarily surprising, but this feedback reminded us uh, just how, un how unique people's circumstances and experiences were depending on their own situation. So a major takeaway from this report is that in trying to design and deliver government programs, especially in extreme situations like this, equity needs to be built into the process. A one size fits all approach um, uh, that we've seen in the past in terms of emergency support uh, is short sighted and doesn't really do nearly enough um, to meet the needs of a diverse uh, public that it's trying to serve. So you'll see in the report a number of recommendations about what we think um, could make these programs more equitable and accessible. And that's really a key uh, aspect of fairness, which is you know, my focus as the ombudsperson. The key takeaway number two is that the demand for these programs is far outstripping uh, their capacity to deliver. We saw in this year's wildfires, uh, and we saw, as we saw in 2021, that when that extreme weather events uh, are relentless. In 2021, repeated wildfires were followed in quick succession by devastating floods. And keep in mind that the frontline emergency support programs is overwhelmingly done by volunteers, some of whom were impacted themselves. We heard stories of people who were displaced themselves who were also volunteers. Their contributions are truly incredible. However, relying on a volunteer uh, workforce, given the complexities of the social and mental health supports needed, uh, really is not acceptable. The model is not sustainable. Building capacity into the system is vital to build in resilience and long-term effectiveness, and, and as is supporting Indigenous self-determination in emergency management. And finally, the sort of third uh, key takeaway is that British Columbia urgently needs a comprehensive plan for long-term displacement. As most of you, I'm sure, know, government has introduced that legislation that will make uh, uh, sweeping changes uh, to how the province responds to emergencies, but um, you know, as with any legislation, it can take months or even years to see change on the ground. And what can't wait is a comprehensive plan to respond and support people who are displaced from their homes for long periods of time. Um, as Sarah noted, over 90% of the uh, people who are displaced need support for longer than, than 72 hours uh, for that. And that's really what 72 hours is what ESS uh, was designed for. So 90% is kind of a startling number. And, and uh, it's a stark reminder that uh, those programs aren't built for today's climate reality. So there's a lot to read in the report, including many people's uh, uh, firsthand experiences. And I would encourage you to take a look. And, and we'll, as I said before, we'll be monitoring government's uh, implementation of our recommendations. So thanks very much for taking the time. And we'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. Um, just uh, pop them in the Q&A. And, uh, uh, and then I think uh, Elizabeth will pose them. Great, great, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so Jay, we do have some interesting questions that have come in. Um, I'm gonna start, there were a number that kind of came that were really, that were sort of forward looking, I would say, um, and recognizing that the events of 2021 uh, might seem like a long time ago. So sort of how have you seen changes or things that have might've have improved looking forward since then? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Uh, uh... The programs we examined, DSS and DFA, are really the same. The programs we examined for 2021 are really the same programs that um, uh, you know exist to today. Um, uh, and so, to the to that extent, they're the same uh, programs. Um, have things improved? Um, there have been some changes since since 2021. Um, uh, there's been a, uh, increased take up of a digital um, tool that uh, allows people to register uh, for ESS. Uh, it has rolled out an e-transfer uh, capacity uh, uh, to allow uh, financial assistance to be delivered um, uh, into people's bank accounts as opposed to by uh, sort of the antiquated voucher system. Uh, and, um, you know, so that has enabled some virtual uh, service delivery, uh, and it gives people some more choice about how to, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, obtain uh, support. Um, uh, and we did see some some take up of, of using uh, online registration virtually by Zoom and other platforms uh, 
so as to kind of expand capacity in some ESS um, uh, sites. Um, but uh, not surprisingly, um, adopting new technology also has some costs and and uh, and some training questions, and that you know was a bit of a challenge, I think, and that's what we heard this year. So um, uh, the ministry has set uh, a goal to have. Um, uh, uh, all eligible communities onboarded to ESS um, uh, two years from now, and um, and we've uh, you know certainly suggested that uh, the ministry work uh, um, towards that. Great, thank you. Um, okay, here's a, another one. Um, uh, this is talking about uh, government resources and commitments for emergency management. Um, uh, it seems like every, almost every day we're seeing government announce more resources for emergency management. Are a number of the things that you're recommending kind of already underway? Yes, well, um, you know, I think we're certainly encouraged. Um, uh, our role as the ombudsperson, my role is to um, hopefully have done a, a persuasive job in an investigation and logical, pra practical, principled recommendations. Uh, and so I was gratified that the, the minister has, uh, you know, accepted all the recommendations that, um, that we've made. Um, uh, and I do believe that the, you know, I think the events in 2017, uh, the events in 2021, uh, uh, and certainly this year, the wildfires have really kind of motivated a, a new commitment and re-energized uh, uh, efforts um, from government um, to modernize emergency management. Um, and I think that that uh, you know has focused you know uh, on pre preparedness, but also response, but also recovery. Uh, and um, you know the the province has taken a number of steps that are important, but. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, my view is they have to do more um, because, um, you know, as we know, and I think the minister has been candid, you know, is candidly repeatedly saying that uh, extreme weather events are on the increase. They're not, uh, they're not going to go away. Um, you know, and I, I'm sure that many of us heard the, you know, many climate experts saying this summer that, uh, you know, as, as difficult as the summer uh, was, it might be one of the best summers we have for the rest of our lives. Uh, and when you think about that, uh, obviously, there's lots of work to do. Um, but I think that, um, it's not just important to make changes legislatively. Um, um, now, you know that's certainly um, important, uh, and um, uh, and then around the, the, for example, the the DFA regulation. Um, but it's also, as our report really tried to indicate, um, that uh, what's also important is actual service delivery on the ground. When you're dealing with people who are facing one of the most traumatic experiences of their life, uh, um, to see their house burned to the ground or or washed away in a river. Um, uh, the, whose course has changed, uh, obviously um, uh, it's important that um, the support for that uh, person be, uh, you know, be done in a manner that's sensitive and, uh, and, uh, and responsive to their needs. So um, we really try to look at what people's individual experiences are. And so uh, I think addressing the shortcomings, you know, is a combination on many, many levels, which definitely includes the legislative response, but it also includes practical on the ground things that can be done at the front lines. Thanks. Um, uh, we have a lot of participants here from local government or connected to, I think, to service delivery on the ground. Um, and so um, a question related to that, um, that there is some mention of local governments in a number of recommendations. Um, and what are your expectations, if anything, for local governments going forward? Yeah, so our investigation um, uh, in this, this particular investigation was very much focused on uh, the province uh, and uh, its oversight and, and responsibility uh, um, uh, to establish the structure for uh, uh, responding to displacement. Um, um, but obviously, uh, the mechanism for, by which that response is built uh, uh, does involve local governments in a big way. Uh, uh, and local governments have a major role in planning for and responding uh, to emergencies uh, in their area. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that uh, uh, it's understood that uh, emergency response requires a team-based approach between uh, between the province and local governments, uh, you know, a, a collaborative partnership, if you will. Uh, and so that definitely influenced our analysis and how we looked at uh, the whole question. And uh, in the report, we had a number of recommendations to, that the ministry work uh, with local governments and First Nations to um, improve data collection, for example, 
um, and uh, understand better uh, the impact of evacuated households. Uh, embed uh, culturally safe practices uh, into all aspects of ESS. Uh, we made recommendations uh, about supporting local governments um, uh, by providing better surge supports for large scale evacuations. And so, as I mentioned this summer, we saw a little bit of of, of uh, a virtual support from other communities uh, around the province. Uh, and so some steps towards, uh, you know, some mechanism of, uh, of surge support. And uh, that's something that uh, could involve the province as well as other, other local governments supporting their neighbors. Um, uh, so I think, you know, having um, a, a number of steps of, that will that the province will take will inevitably involve local governments uh, and uh, uh, because the province has accepted all our recommendations i'm anticipating that uh, uh, those discussions are going to happen great thanks um, another question um, is uh, relates to that point about monitoring um, how will the general public be informed of the results of your office's monitoring of um, implementation so if you could speak just a little bit to that sure so um, whenever we release a public report, um, um, of course, we, uh, 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 as I said earlier, we, we're, we're not we're not order making people. We're we're persuading people, um, and so it's up to the public authorities that we investigate to decide whether to implement our recommendations. But where they do uh, accept our recommendations and commit uh, to implementing them. Uh, and as I've said a couple of times, uh, in this case, the government has accepted all of them. Um, we then want to make sure that that uh, that, that uh, uh, response and commitment actually takes place. So we'll be monitoring uh, that. And what that means is that periodically um, over the next couple of years, we will ask uh, the ministry for updates on each of those 20 recommendations. And then we'll make our own independent judgment about whether we believe that um, the government has uh, uh, sufficiently uh, uh, complied with the letter and the spirit of that recommendation, and then we'll release a, a subsequent report. So you can look forward to uh, a couple of years from now, us doing a monitoring report uh, on how government is doing uh, in implementing these recommendations. Uh, and we do that with all our reports where government has has recommended, or sorry, has accepted uh, at least some of our recommendations. So that's a way in which we can um, uh, uh, hold the government to account. But um, it's also possible for others uh, that our report is public and and really um, a part of uh, uh, of our role is to bring shine a light, as I said at the beginning uh, on these issues. And anybody can ask uh, for an update uh, uh, from government uh, about how they're doing and implementing ombudsperson recommendations. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's open to anybody to uh, ask that same question. So uh, really, uh, my expectation is that uh, NGOs, local governments, First Nations, all will pick up our report. And if they see things that they think are valid and wise, uh, that they're, that it's open to them to also ask those same questions. Great, thanks. Um, maybe just one more question um, uh, someone posed was whether or not you were aware of any other jurisdictions um, uh, doing similar reporting like this on climate or fairness or a similar kind of review, um, if you want to speak to that. Um, so just, uh, uh, I mean, certainly it's an active discussion uh, among uh, our colleagues in other jurisdictions and other ombuds offices, but it can also come up in different ways. And uh, uh, I was on a panel last week or two weeks ago uh, uh, since our report came out uh, uh, with a professor from New Zealand uh, who has done a lot of studies, not with respect to a climate disaster, but a, a disaster nonetheless. And that was the 2011 uh, earthquakes uh, in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, and the impact of displacement uh, uh, for the people there and, the, and how uh, both private insurers and the justice system dealt with uh, conflict and, and uh, disagreements uh, uh, that arose from that and people who uh, weren't able to be compensated for long periods of time uh, because of the inability of those systems to respond adequately to the uh, problems they had. So I think this whole notion of, uh, of looking after people um, uh, better who, uh, who uh, are suffering long-term displacement for whatever cause um, uh, you know, is something that's actively being discussed uh, in many jurisdictions around the world. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I see in the Q&A that our team is also kind of responding to some more specific questions that are coming in, but I, I think we might wrap up uh, in general now. Those were fantastic questions. Um, and so if we weren't able to get to them or you don't hear back from us, um, we can follow, out, follow up. Um, and of course, feel free to reach out to us directly. 
Um, if we can move to the next slide, our contact information is listed here, should be listed here and posted in the chat. Great, okay, thank you. Um, uh, so we'll also put that in the chat. Um, and again, we're gonna provide a specific link to the section on the website that includes um, a direct link to the report. And you can click on that to read the whole report to get kind of an overview of, um, oops, that's wrong. Uh, thanks. Uh, to get kind of an overview of the report, the findings and recommendation, more detail on the things that we've talked about today. Um, so uh, we want to direct you to those resources if you're interested in kind of learning more. Um, we'll post this webinar recording um, when it's available as well. So thank you again for uh, coming and attending today and for your attention. Um, and uh, we'll stay on the line to try to wrap up those last questions for anyone um, that uh, has reached out uh, uh, in that way. And uh, again, thank you for joining us today. <laughs>